Lord, I love you today more than I did yesterday. And I love you tomorrow or again. For you care so tenderly in everything concerning me. So I'll praise you most of all that I'm reaching. I was nothing but a sinner, just a poor lost wretched soul. Hungry for the truth, but I had nowhere left to go. Oh, but then a change took place. Amazing grace became real in me. So I'll praise you most of all that I'm reaching. Reaching is such a small word, but it means the world to me. It means loving life, the very air I breathe. For it means that I am pardoned. I'm forgiven for my sins. I lift holy hands to you, Lord, I'm redeemed. I was nothing but a sinner, just a poor lost friend soul hungry for the truth but I had nowhere left to go oh but then a change took place amazing grace became real in me so I'll praise you most of all that I'm I'm getting homesick to see those faces that I used to know, the ones who left us down here below. They went away and I miss them so. They're in God's presence now. He'll get me there to where they are somehow, where everything is bright and fair. That sweet land of God somewhere In that sweet land of God somewhere No more party, no more care And by God's grace I'm going there With all its joy that's beyond Compare and I am ready should he call today Like a bird I'll just all of heaven I will share In that sweet land of God somewhere I'm getting homesick To see the one who paid my penalty That debt he paid for me at Calvary it Would have cost me eternally I long to see the place it's lighted by the Savior's precious face That place he went away to prepare In that sweet land of God somewhere In that sweet land of God somewhere No more parting, no more care By God's grace, I'm going there To all its joy beyond Compare 
like a bird, I'll just fly away. And all of heaven I will share in that sweet land of God somewhere. And all of heaven I will share in that sweet land of God somewhere. Amen. All right. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. All right. If you got your Bibles, take your Bibles and open up with me to the book of Romans this morning. Romans chapter number six. Romans chapter number six is where you'll find the text. I really want to look at one verse, but I want to lead you up to that. So we'll start at Romans chapter number six. And um, when you get your place, say amen. Romans chapter number six. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Father. In Jesus' name this morning, I need you. These people need you. We're here because we need you. God, we're grateful that you're the only one that's worthy to be worshipped. And you're the only one that's able to help us. You're the only one that we should look to. I pray, God, you'd help us today. Look to you for help. There are those that may be here today that need to be saved. I pray, God, they'd look to you and be saved. I pray, God, you'd help Christians today. Help us in all we do. We thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. In Romans chapter number 6, the grand subject of the chapter is sanctification. Uh, Justification is the work that God does for you when he saves you. And then sanctification is the work that he's doing in you after you're saved. And sanctification many times is looked at positionally as as an event that took place. But it's also practically as an experience that we are working out. And so when we come to Romans chapter number 6, this is the process by which God not only has set you apart, but he is setting you apart. He is preparing you uh, for a purpose. And he begins in verse number 1 where he said, What shall we say then? Shall uh, we continue in sin that grace may uh, may, may abound? And he said in verse 2 that the astounding answer is God forbid. And so the argument is that some would say that well, I've been saved by grace, and because I'm saved by grace, and where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. So the more that I sin, the more God has grace, and so I should just continue living in sin. And Paul stops and says, no, that's not it. And so in chapter number 6, he goes on explaining how that we know that as we were baptized, or we died with Christ, we, we, were, we were buried with him in, in spiritual baptism, but we were raised to walk in newness of life. He saved us by his grace, and thank God that he did. But he raised us up so that we would walk differently, new, a a brand new creature now in in him. And so he goes down through there talking about these positional truths, putting into practice. He said we ought to know some things. We ought to know that our old man's crucified in verse number 6. 
That is, know that you died with Christ. And that, listen, we're not to serve, uh, henceforth serve sin. We're, we are freed from sin if we've been saved. And that is not that we cannot sin, but we do not live under the dominion and the power of sin any longer. And he said, we know that. We know that Christ is raised from the dead. That uh, Listen, if we are, are in him, we're going to be alive in him. And I'm paraphrasing as we work through here. And he said, you need to take what you know, that Jesus died for your sin, that he was buried, that he rose again, that you positionally were in him. And then you need to reckon it so. That is, you need to sit down with your spiritual calculator and figure it up and look at what he did for you and that you were in him and that now you don't have to live like you used to. You can live now like he wants you to because he's living through you. That's sanctification is what he's talking about. And he said, how do you do that? And you do that by not letting sin reign anymore, verse 12, in your mortal body. But you yield your members as instrument of righteousness, verse 13. So whose servant you are today is dependent upon who you are serving. And so the picture that Paul uses down through the rest of the chapter is sort of like a soldier uh, that is under the authority of a king. And he is the servant to the one he yields himself to. And as he goes and he talks about sin... He said, sin, in verse 14, shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. And so, as believers, that's us. He's speaking about believers that we are not under the dominion of sin anymore. Yeah, man. That, that ought to excite somebody. And he said, in verse 16, know you not that to whom you yield yourselves, your servants to obey. Like servants, you're his servants, ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. And then he comes down, and I'm going to go down to verse 17. He said, but thank God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Were. Notice, past tense, were. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. That's the present case. They were servants of sin, but presently they are free from sin and servants of righteousness. He said, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, but as ye have, for as ye have yielded your members, service to uncleanness and the iniquity unto iniquity, that is, you just go from one sin to the next, and that's what sin does. It grows, it gets worse. Even so now, now, now that you're not under the dominion of sin, now that you're freed from sin, even so now yield your members, that's your body, service to righteousness unto holiness. For when we were the servants of sin, we were free from righteousness. Before we got saved, we didn't care anything about living for God. Before, Listen, before I got saved, I didn't care nothing about coming to church. Before I got saved, I didn't care nothing about pleasing with God. I was free from righteousness. I wasn't bound to that. I wasn't desiring that. But verse 21 said, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? In other words, now that I got saved, I, there's a lot of things, I promise you. There's a lot of things if you could go dig up my past that you'd find in my past, I'd be ashamed of if I was uh, living in them now. Yeah, man, I'm ashamed of some things I did before I got saved. He said, for the end of those things is death. Don't y'all sit there and act like a bunch of sanctified church mouses. Some of y'all got a past too, amen. But now, but now, verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become service to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So in verse 21, we see that the contrast here between the two lifestyles, the contrast of the one who is a servant to sin and the result is death. And then in verse number 22, the contrast is made of the one who have become servants of God and, the, and it goes unto holiness and the end is everlasting life. I don't know about you, but if I had to choose between death or life, I'd choose life every time. But seemingly in our society, in the world in which we live, it's as if you can wave the caution flag, take the lights and flash them, holler on the loudspeakers, and tell people that you're headed for destruction, you're headed for death, and they seemingly do not care. And in verse 23, it, he sums it up, and he said, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the help of the Lord, I want to preach on this thought for just a few minutes. Just a few minutes. And I want to preach on this thought on the ruin and the remedy of mankind. The ruin and the remedy of mankind. 
when I look in this text in verse number 23, he said the wages. I, I thought about the rightful reaping that takes place in this verse. There's a rightful reaping. He said the wages. Everybody here knows what a wage is, whether by that name or another name. You may know by the name paycheck, benefit, stipend, the idea of a soldier. He wants his, what's coming to him, right? A servant. You go to work, everybody that went to work this week, you worked all week, you were expecting that at the end of the week, or whether it's monthly, bi-weekly, however you get paid, you're expecting that at the end of that period, you're going to get the fat check. Somebody say amen. Some, somebody needs that direct deposit. Somebody wants what's coming to them. Is that right? And so you work for that, and you're looking forward to that. And, and that's, that's, that's a driving force. The farmer goes to the field, and he goes out there with his seed, usually in the springtime. And as he goes there in the, in the field and sows his seed, he sows that seed with the idea and with the intention that that seed will eventually sprout, come up a plant, and produce some fruit. Right? He doesn't just go out there because he likes to ride the tractor and throw seed everywhere. He throws seed out because he's expecting some fruit eventually. The Bible said, be not deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth. That shall he also reap. The principle is all throughout the word of God. If you reap it, you sow it. Or, or you sow it, you reap it. What you sow, you're going to reap. You go out here and plant tomatoes and eventually, Lord, help us. There'll be some maters coming up. Amen. But there's a rightful, uh, a rightful reaping. This, this wages of, of sin, he said, is death. The wages is death. That's what he said, that, that sinners have come unto them. The wages is death. If you look in that verse, the wages is death. You say, preacher, I, I don't know that we deserve that. I, I don't know that, that I, I want death. I don't know that death coming to me. Well, he said that the wages of sin is death, so we see the, the rightful reaping. They, they are going to get exactly what they have earned. Are you listening? The wages is death. And then, not only do I see a, a, a rightful reaping, but I see the ruinous reason. You say, preacher, why are we looking for a payday of death? Here's what it is, because the wages of sin is death. That's the ruinous reason. What is it that causes death to come? What is? Listen, before there was sin, there was no death. In Genesis chapter number 2, you'll find that God told Adam and Eve, he, he put them in a beautiful garden, and he told them, but you can have everything, you can eat of every tree, but this one tree. The tree of the tree, uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said, oh, that tree, he said, thou shalt not eat. He said, in the day that you eat thereof, he said, you shall die. You shall surely die. And next chapter over, there's old Eve taking a bite and getting Adam to take a bite. And since then, men and women had begun to die. You say, well, they didn't die physically. No, they died spiritually. You see, death in the Bible is not, not annihilation. Death in the Bible is not always a disappearance, if you will, but it's a separation. It's a separation. See, up until that point, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. They walked with the voice of the Lord. They talked with him. They communed with him. But then there came a time when they took of what they should not have taken of. They transgressed. They went beyond what God said. And then instead of walking with him and communing with him, they were hiding from him. Hiding from him. So there's the wages of sin is death. Death is the reason. You see, the Bible says in Jeremiah 31, 30, that if the one who sins, he's going to die because of his sin. In Ezekiel chapter number uh, 18 and verse number 4 and verse number 20 as well, the Bible said that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Death is coming to all of us because all of us have sinned. The Bible said in James chapter 1, that lust, when it's conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death, right? That's the LSD of the devil, lust, sin, death, lust, sin, death. So we have lust, cravings, things that our flesh desires, and we go after them. It's exactly what Eve did, right? She's tempted in the same way you're tempted, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Adam and Eve succumb to the temptation, and then you and I have that nature now, and we succumb every time we sin. Lust, a craving, a desire that is of the forbidden, sin by partaking, sin by fulfilling, sin by fulfilling a desire in a way that God would, would not have intended for us to fulfill. 
And then the result is death. Death. There, there's a spiritual death. There is a physical death. A physical death. Nobody was going to die. God created Adam and Eve. And that's one of the acts of mercy when he put them out of the garden. He put those cherubim there with the so flaming swords. That he didn't let them in that they take of the tree of life in a sinful body that was constantly dying. But he allowed them to go, not to that tree, but thank God a couple thousand years later, he put up another tree and he let his son Jesus Christ go to that tree so that they'd bow at that tree, they'd get a brand new body and a brand new life and live forever. Hallelujah, says. Amen. But there's physical death. The wages of sin is death. Every one of us have an appointment. Everybody here in the sound of my voice got an appointment. The Bible said it's appointed unto men who wants to die. And after this, the judgment. You're not going to get out of that appointment. The only way you'll get out of that appointment is to go into rapture. But by the upper taker or the undertaker, one way or the other, you're leaving here. Nobody likes to think about that. But why, why does death come? Death comes because of sin. That is the ruinous reason. Back in chapter 5, verse 12, Paul said, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, and so that death that passed upon, watch this, all men, for that all have sinned. That's me, you, every one of us. From Adam all the way through, every one of us has sinned. You say, Preacher, I don't sin. You just lied, so you just sinned. 1 John chapter 1 makes it very clear. If you say you've not sinned, you make God a liar. And I promise you, God ain't a liar you are. He cannot lie. And so the reason that death comes is sin. And I thought about that, the, the ruin of mankind. You think about the ruin that comes when we think about death. We think about the spiritual ruin, the spiritual degeneration. You think it's bad. Man, we look all around us. I know uh, the... Uh, the uh, evolutionists would have us to think that everything's just getting better. But the problem with that is, that just ain't so. It's a crazy thing with facts. They don't go away. And you look at history, you look at the news, you just get on your phone, you ain't even got to get on the computer, you just pick up your phone now. And every day it seems like it gets worse and worse and worse. Exactly like the Bible said it. You didn't have to ask Darwin what was going to happen. God told you what was going to happen. He said in the, in the last days, evil men and seducers were going to wax worse and worse. He told us these things are coming. He told us about the wars and the rumors of the wars. He told us about the disease. And so we, we see a spiritual decline, a spiritual degeneration, a, a separation from God. We see a moral death, a moral ruin. We see the defilement. We see the defilement in our day. We see, just turn, once again, turn on the television. They don't even know whether they're a boy or a girl, much less who to marry or even where to go to the bathroom. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just talking about the moral degradation and the, the decline of our society. Where they think you're a crazy radical because you was born a boy and you want to be a boy. Or you was born a girl and you're happy being just the way God made you. Can I say to you little girls, you ought to thank God God made you a little girl. Don't try to be the man. Don't try to play the man. Be a little girl. Be thankful to be a little girl. Amen. And you boys, don't be a bunch of sissies. Amen. Be glad you're a boy. I'm going to preach just for a second, y'all. Hey, them boys ought to grow up. Hey, listen, with puppy dog tails and snails and pocket knives, cap guns, bicycles, motorcycles, go-karts, they don't need baby dogs. Yeah, man. They baby them. Our, our society is morally declined. Just get you a picture. Just go somewhere. Just go somewhere and get on the internet and just picture. Find you a picture of the average male in 1945 and find the average male in 2024. I'm talking about a moral decline. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual decline. It's a moral decline. And then, it, and then we look around us and we see the physical decline. We see the physical disease. Y'all remember Methuselah lived 969 years, and you go before the flood, and men lived a whole lot longer. And now the, as, as we have, I say progress, but as we have really digressed, but as we have gone down through history, that age just seemed to taper off to where now what are we, about 70, 80 years old on average, somewhere around in there? 
I think the average lifespan of a male in America is 78. Unless you had COVID, then it's 82. Y'all get a hold of that in a minute. But I'm simply saying that, that we don't live 800, 900 years old no more. We, have, we see the physical, we see defilement, we see disease, we see uh, disabilities, and then we eventually see death. We see, the Bible told us this, that the wages of sin is death. The whole reason behind it all, Hot Rod, is, de- is sin. That's the whole, that's the whole reason why, why we see things crumbling around us. It's sin. That's the reason why. Listen, that's the reason why everything in this world that dies, dies. We go out in the fall, right? Everybody likes to go out in fall. How many of y'all like to go out in fall? Look at the leaves. Beautiful, right? Died. Y'all say, look at them dead leaves. Ain't they pretty? Exactly what you're seeing. You're seeing a, a, a result. You know, before, the, before Adam sinned, there, there was no death. Y'all caught, y'all caught that in Romans 5. For it's by one man sin into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. Y'all get a hold of that? That's why we know nobody lived before Adam. Because he's the one that brought sin and death in. Somebody say amen. Amen. All right? So there's a ruinous reason. Sin. You say, man, I I don't like cancer. I don't like this. I don't like sin. But it's not just disease, but every one of us face the result of sin, not just in the physical, but in the spiritual. Because you, in actuality, you were born breathing physically, but you was born dying spiritually. Dead. Dead in your trespasses and sin. None of us were born saved. I believe, and I believe I can show you with the Bible pretty clearly, that children are born safe, if you will. They belong to God. Up until they get to the age of accountability, whatever that age may be. But when they can understand right from wrong, they can choose between God or reject God. But up to that point, God covers them by His grace. How he does, it's up to him. He's a sovereign, mighty God. He's a whole lot better being God than I am. I ain't got to figure all that out. But none of us were born saved. None of us. Y'all all right? The Bible said that all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Every last one of us. For as my kids over there are, hey, you look over there and you think, man, them innocent. They are not innocent. They've got a nature inside of them. They've got a nature inside of them that's called a sin nature or a sin principle. They've got a bent toward, a lean toward. Now listen, as believers, we still have the possibility to sin, but we don't no longer have the necessity to sin. Remember, we're not under the power, the dominion of sin. But don't sit there and think because you're saved that you can't sin. The wages of sin is death. I thought about that death and, and what it brings. I thought, about, I thought about the death to nations. You know, you study, the, you study history, and you study the history of Rome and how Rome was a great empire, the Roman Empire. Part of the reason, part of the, and I know there were some political things, but part of the reason, one of the probably top four reasons that, that the Roman Empire fell was because of their sexual perversion and their overindulgence in it. You look at our society today, and you see how America, I know y'all think America's getting better, and y'all building back better. I ain't figured out what y'all building. But America's going downhill, friend. And I'm not doom and gloom. I'm simply telling you that the reason America is doom and gloom, it's not, listen, it's not because we lost our Constitution. We still got our Constitution. We still got a Declaration of Independence. The reason why is because we got spiritual wickedness in high places. We got sin all around us. You might as well say amen or owe me. And listen, we got the leaders of our land that are promoting junk like sodomy and abortion and, and all this perversion and transgenders. And, and they're promo- they ain't just allowing it. They are promoting it. And I don't care what their name is. I don't care what party they're in. And we got so-called preachers that are afraid to say anything about it. Well, I don't want to offend them. That's why we're in the shape we're in now because nobody wants to offend nobody. What happened to preaching the word line upon line and precept upon precept and speaking the truth in love? You say, preacher, if you speak the truth in love, you won't say anything about that sin. No, if you love them, you'll tell them the truth because if nobody tells them the truth, they'll never get it right. We see a nation's dying. I'm telling you, if the Lord tarries, America will fall. 
And I'm not a doom and gloomer. I love America. Thank God. I thank God for the red, white, and blue. I'm an American through and through. But I'll promise you this. I'll promise you this. The Bible said that righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Yeah, man. The Bible said that, that those that forget God, they'll be turning to hell. Every nation. Nations fall because of sin. Not only nations, I thought about churches. Churches are crumbling. We, we've seen great, what we, what we would deem as great across our land. Churches, and they grew and they got big and, and people were just filling them. And next thing you know, sin entered the camp. I'm talking about open, blatant sin. And the next thing you know, that thing crumbles. And the next thing you know, what used to be a movement becomes a monument. Can I tell you something? This church right here can dwindle and go away in the next generation if we let sin get in. If we don't, if we don't confront sin and preach against sin, churches can crumble. Homes can be divided. Homes can die. Why, does, why do marriages crumble? Why do marriage? I tell you why, sin. The Bible said God hates divorce. He don't hate the people who get divorced, but he hates it. So it's not God's will that we go out and get married to every Tom, Dick, and Harry. God's got somebody he wants you to marry if he wants you to get married. And you, you find he, that person by walking with God, spending time with God, and getting close to God, and they get close to God, and then y'all get close to each other. Next thing you know, you get married. And when you get married, here's what God said. He said that not man put asunder what God had brought together. Marriage is to be till death do us part. Now, I understand the hurtful part of divorce that somebody walked out on somebody and they couldn't help it. I understand that. But I'm saying we live in a g generation where the first thing that pops up, uh, the first temptation that comes, they take it. First easy way out, they're looking for it. Somebody say amen. And marriages are crumbling all around us because of sin. We live in a society now. They say, well, if you ain't happy, just find somebody else that makes you happy. No, if you ain't happy, find out what makes them happy and they'll make you happy. Yeah, man, you made a commitment. You made a, you made a promise between you and them and God. So I say, man. And I thought about this, not only the death that we see in society around us, the death of nations, death of churches, death of homes, but then let's bring it down to individuals. The death of individuals. See, once again, it's pointed on me and wants to die. You were born, you were born spiritually dead. But you're going to die physically. And if you die physically, dead spiritually, you're going to die the second death and die eternally. Romans chapter, or excuse me, Revelation chapter number 20 talks about how those that were not found in the book of life, they were cast in the lake of fire, and they're going to burn there forever and ever. And he said, this is the second death. That second death is eternal death. It's eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. The rightful reaping. The wages of sin is death. The ruinous reason, sin. But then I see in this verse, that all that's doom and gloom, right? All that bad news. But the latter part of this verse is the good news. The latter part of this verse said, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You may be sitting here this morning and say, Preacher, I'm living in sin. I'm under the power of sin. I'm under the dominion of sin. Preacher, I enjoy sin. Preacher, I realize the day that I'm guilty because all of sin that comes short of God. Preacher, I don't know what I'm going to do. Preacher, I'm going to die. I'm not going to die physically, but I'm going to die eternally. I'm going to die the second death. Preacher, what do I do? Here's the good news. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You think about a gift. You don't buy a gift. You don't earn a gift. A gift is something free. A gift is if I walk up to you and give you something that, you, listen, and I say, hey, I want you to have this. All you have to do is simply receive it. If I say, here's a gift, take the gift. Take the gift. Sadly, that's exactly what a lot of people do. God's saying, I've got salvation for you. I'll give you eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but i got a free gift for you. i got a gift. i got a gift. Turn around. i, I got a gift. And many, many people do exactly that. They turn their head. No, I'm looking for something better. That's too easy. That's too simple. You know, a lot of people are going to miss heaven because they think getting saved is that's just too simple. i got to do something. It's, salvation and, and being saved is not about what you do. It's about what Jesus Christ has already done. The work is done. 
You, listen, we don't do good works to be saved. As Christians, we ought to do good works because we're saved. But our good works do not save us. Salvation is the gift of God. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the gift of God. Some people say, well, I'm doing my best. Your best ain't going to cut it. All our righteousness is filthy rags, Isaiah 64 said. But the gift of God is eternal life. I think you ought to live right. I think if you're a Christian, you ought to live right. You ought to walk right. You ought to talk right. You ought to spit right. I mean, I think you ought to do right. Well, Bob Jones Sr. said, do right, do right. And when the stars fall, do right. We ought to do right. But doing right don't make you saved. The only thing that makes you saved is for you to receive the gift. He said, the gift of God is eternal life. So you get that gift, and when you get that gift, it's eternal life. There's eternal life in there. And how did you get that? He said, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm looking forward to that eternal life, somebody said. Well, I got the good news for you. If you're saved, you don't have to look forward to eternal life. If you're saved, you've got eternal life. Amen. I'm telling you, if you got saved, you got eternal life the moment that you called upon the name of the Lord. You see, you pass from death unto life. And John 5, 24 said, uh, Jesus said in John 5, 24, he said, uh, barely, barely, he said, he that hear it, let's see, let me get over so I don't misquote it. In John chapter 5, y'all know John 3, 16, for, said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have, have everlasting life. But John 5, 24 said this. In John 5, 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him. That's all you had to do. Believeth on him that sent me. Believeth on him that sent me. Watch this. Hath everlasting life. That hath is, every, hey, that hath, that's a present tense. He said, you believe and you have everlasting life. And watch this, it gets even better. And shall not come into condemnation, but is past, already is past, already happened, is past from death unto life. I'm telling you, if you're saved this morning, if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've repented of your sin and turned to the Savior, if that's you today, you can say, I'm never going to die. I'm never going to die. You say, well, preacher, I saw somebody was saved. They went to the graveyard. Oh, their body went to the graveyard. That shell went to the casket. But I'm telling you, they're more alive than they've ever been. Because for the child of God, I'm going to close my eyes on this side. But on the other side, I'm going to wake up and sleep no more. Praise God. I'm telling you for the child of God, Jesus said, though he were dead, yet shall he live. First John 5, 11, John wrote and said, and this is a record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Verse 12 said, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You've either got the Son of God, or you don't have life, or you have the Son of God, and you have life. Praise God. So the question today is are you in the ruin or have you received the remedy? Because the only remedy is Jesus Christ. Eternal life. How do I get it, preacher? By receiving him. In John 11, Jesus said, John wrote in John 1 11, he came to his own and his own received him not. They rejected him. The Jews turned him away. He said, but to as many as received him, received him by faith, trusted him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. The moment you receive him by faith, he said, that's my child. You might have been an orphan, you might have been an outcast, but when you turn to God in faith and repentance and trust Jesus Christ and the finished work, he said, that's my son, that's my daughter. Somebody said, we're going to be the sons of God. We're going to, no, the Bible said we are the sons of God. Now, 1 John 3, 2, now, beloved, now, now, now are we the sons of God. Does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we should be like him. Amen. I'm simply saying the, the world around us is decaying. We see it day by day. Society's getting worse. Government's getting worse. Education system's getting worse. I mean, it's just getting bad. Even, even so-called religion is getting worse. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying we ain't getting better as a society. We're getting worse. Common sense, experience, open your eyes. 
It's, it's, it's bad. But there's a remedy. And his name is Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. I'm not asking you this morning, have you ever joined the church? I'm not asking you, have you ever been baptized? I'm not asking you this morning if you're a good person. We know the answer to that. The Bible said there's none good, no, not one. I'm asking you this morning, has there ever been a time, has there ever been a place where you turn from your sinful condition and by faith receive the free gift of salvation? And if not, if you're not sure of that, today could be the day. God's speaking to your heart. He wants to save you. You say, preacher, I don't know if God wants to save me. I'll help you with that. The Bible said he would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. You say, preacher, I don't know if he would save somebody like me. The Bible said the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men can't slacken us, but he's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish. That's not his desire, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everybody saved. And if you don't get saved before you die, it won't be God's fault. You'll be like those Jews that Jesus looked at one day, and he said, I, w- I desired, I would have brought you in. I desired to have you, but ye would not. You won't go to hell and blame God. Are you listening to me? You won't suffer that second death eternally because of what God done. It'll be because of what you. Hell is not full of people that God hated. Hell is full of people that rejected and hated God. So the question today is, have you received the free gift? Now, I'm not asking, listen, our churches are full of people that are trying to be good. They're trying to do good. They're they're trying to let their good outweigh their bad. That's not going to cut it. God's, listen, this this ain't going to happen. But if this happened, if you got to the end of your life, you died, you stood before God, and he said, what should I let you in heaven for? And And you said, well, my good outweighs my bad. If that's the case, if that's going to cut it, let me ask you a question. If that's what's going to get you in heaven, why did Jesus have to die? Jesus died for our sins. He didn't die so we go work for salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. I'm asking you today, have you ever received Jesus Christ? Have you ever received the free gift, the free pardon of sin and everlasting life, eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is the rightful and the righteous remedy. Jesus Christ. Let's stand all across the altar. Father, I pray, God, you would take the message today. I pray, God, that you would speak to hearts and lives. There may be some here today that need to be saved. And I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit of God would speak to their heart, convict and convince, and save that soul that needs to be saved. Help us today in all that we say and do as Christians are praying. Oh, God, in Jesus' name, help us. Oh, God, help us in Jesus' name. We're standing with the heads bowed and eyes closed. The piano is beginning to play softly. As she plays, I ask this question. How many would say, preacher, no doubt in my mind, there's been a time, there's been a place. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, 100%, no doubt about it, I know that I have received Jesus Christ. I know that I'm saved. I want to raise my hand as a testimony. I know that. I'm not thinking so, not hoping so, but I know so. You can let them back down. They saw them couldn't raise their hand. I'm not here to poke, poke fun. I'm not here to point you out. But I'll give you an opportunity. You don't have to join this church. You don't even have to like me, per se. But I'm asking you, if you don't know Jesus, would you like to come to know him today? Would you like to have your sins forgiven? Would you like to receive Jesus and the remedy for sin? If you would like to be saved today, we would love to invite you to come. If you're a lady, you come and we'll have a lady take the Bible and show you what God says about how you can be saved. If you're a man, we'll let a man take the Bible and show you how the Bible tells you you can be saved. What about it, mom, dad, young person? What about it, young man, young lady? Do you know you're saved? you know you're on the way to heaven? Do you know that? you hold on to hope so? My family? Or do you know Jesus personally? Have you trusted Him? Have you received Him? Today could be the day of salvation for you. God dealing with your heart? 
What about it, sir? What about it, ma'am? 